So I know that, Emily, you've been on the show before and, and you explained our circadian rhythms in a lot of detail, but I think it will be important for us to kind of trace back over some of that. So when, when you're saying that eating at different times of the day can affect our health differently and this relates back to circadian biology, can you break that down for us, go right back to what our circadian rhythms are, this idea of a central clock, peripheral clocks, and how this kind of all ties together with meal timing? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> so ask more follow-ups. I'll really try to keep this one short because there's a lot we could go into. Um, the circadian system is really an anticipor- anticipatory system in your body that prepares your body to do whatever it would need to do. So it's going to help your digestive system kind of shut down and break down calories that you already have when you're sleeping. So you can fuel yourself when it expects you to fast. It's going to predict when it should have a cortisol in- spike to help help you wake up. It's going to predict when your heart rate needs to be lower or your muscle strength needs to be stronger. You are functionally a different person at different times of day from every level, from behavior, um, you know, molecular structure, like anything that you would get measured at a doctor's office pretty much changes at different times of day, you know, hormone release, anything like that. Um, and we don't, you know, we have to take in cues from our environment. We all have about a 24 hour pattern of how all of these processes work to keep, you know, everything in the right place at the right time. But we coordinate these with the, with the environment and the two main cues that we get are light and food. So light is going to be the biggest cue to talk to this clock in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is just a geographical term. That sounds very complicated. Um, It's just where it's located, but that part of your brain will integrate light signals. It'll help control your uh, sleep wake patterns. And it kind of talks to all the other clocks throughout your body. Um, And when I say clocks throughout your body, pretty much every cell in your body has a clock. Um, But when you eat actually directly affects each of those individual clocks directly because nutrition availability directly signals uh, the cells to say what time of day it is. So if you're eating at the same time every day and you're fasting at the same time every day, your body can predict that. It can have enzymes ready to digest things. It can help coordinate other things that are going on within the cell because food availability is a very strong cue to tell the cell what time of day it is. Whereas if you're eating at inoptimal times, you know, when your body wouldn't expect it, say the middle of the night, one, your insulin secretion is shut down. So you can't process your glucose properly Two, you're telling your body it's a different time of day. It may try to shift uh, those clocks directly. Um, like there's many different things that can kind of be, um, kind of compromised as how your body would function just by when you're actually eating that food. So I'm just thinking about this and, and just throwing this out out loud, but let's say it's 11 p.m. at night and it's dark. My central clock is, is re- detecting that or being regulated by that uh, change in light from light to, to darkness and anticipating that I'm about to go into a state of rest but then let's say I go and eat a meal is it my is it the peripheral clocks that are then becoming disrupted they're thinking that it's still time to be active and digesting whilst the central clock is saying hey it's time to rest and relax and so you get kind of uh, a sort of uh, a loss of alignment between those two clocks it's a, yeah, it's a little bit like that. And it's also the, sorry, it's a little bit that, um, I mean, eating is a stimulation cue anyway, it's an arousal cue in its own regard. Like if you're driving late at night and you get tired, the first thing you do is start snacking and it'll help you wake up. So eating at the wrong time kind of sends a cue to your, your whole body that it's, it's the wrong time. Um, but like things like when you talk about it's getting dark, well, one of the things that happens at night when it's getting dark is melatonin is secreted. Melatonin directly sec- um, inhibits insulin secretion. So say you have a milkshake in the middle of the night. Well, now your body can't process that glucose. You might get a really high spike in blood glucose and those kinds of things that are happening perpetually over and over again can lead to things like prediabetes or diabetes. Yeah. And the way you can kind of think about the misalign these misalignments between the clock is a really simple level. So, you know, if your central clock says it's dark outside, it's saying, okay, let's slow metabolism down. Meanwhile, you're eating, so your peripheral clocks are like, let's pick it up. So it's effectively like you get conflicting signals Mm -hmm. and your metabolism is confused. So you get all kinds of problems in your metabolism. Mm -hmm. And when you said a calorie is not a calorie earlier, 
that's a that's a statement that I know ruffles a lot of feathers. Um, and I just want to clarify. So, so you're you're not saying that the unit of energy is is different. What you're saying is at different times of the day, our body is utilizing that energy differently. Is that right? Yeah. So you're going to process it differently. How it's going to affect your system is different. So like, even if say you had a lot of lights on and you're skewed and your melatonin wasn't high for whatever reason, um, you're still sending a cue to your circadian clocks to say that it's a certain time of day, right? Like there's a lot of different pathways and we don't have enough time or detail to go into all of them, but there are dozens of molecular pathways that are directly affected by, you know, gaining, you know, by nutrient detection um, and that are affected by the circadian clock. And most of them are affected by both, like these work hand in hand. And so when you give this kind of conflicting cue, it throws the system off. And if you do it once, you know, the system's pretty robust. You don't kind of phase shift overnight. You don't, you know, your body doesn't say, oh, I got this at midnight. So now this is now 6 p.m. and I'm going to shift six hours in one day. Like it doesn't do that. But when you have these erratic cues, like some days I start eating at 6 a.m. and some days I start eating at 11 and some days I end eating at midnight. Some days I end eating at five. Like your body has no idea what time it is anymore. And those rhythms over time get completely dampened. And so all of those processes are not able, able to work properly. And so you're really just kind of compromising the overall mm. system. So today, are you of the view that this, this kind of chronic circadian disruption, and I've heard you use that terminology before, as opposed to say acute mm. circadian disruption, which people experience when they fly to the other side of the world, are you of the view that this is a, an integral sort of contributing factor to, to chronic disease that we see today. And, and to take that a step further, if you look back, let's say 100, 200, 300 years with whatever data we have access to, have we seen a, a change in our, our meal timing uh, over the years? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that that is definitely a kind of a, underlying problem that we become very ignorant to. And when we had kind of the industrial revolution and, and around the clock ability to work and consume food and all of these things that we didn't have hundreds of years ago, we have started to kind of abuse the system that we had, you know, we didn't know we were doing. We just kind of thought, oh, this is available. I can do it now. Um, and we didn't realize how much we were hurting ourselves. Um, so I, I do think that's kind of a chronic overlying problem. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I, I think that's how I would say it. I think chronic circadian disruption is a big contributor to a lot of chronic diseases, um, whatever they may be. Yeah, and the WHO now now classifies night shift work as a likely carcinogen, right? So that goes to show you how, how good the evidence is. Mm-hmm.